So in the last video, we talked about how in this scenario over here to the left, there were depositors who originally deposited 1,000 gold coins with a goldsmith. That goldsmith then loaned out some of that money, 900 of it, to a bridge project. And that bridge project used that money to pay workers. And so these workers over here, who were paid 900 gold coins, also become effectively depositors. The reason is because they can go to the goldsmith at any time with these deposit notes worth 900 gold coins and ask for their gold coins back at any time. So that makes them depositors. And so in this way, at the end of this, we have a thousand gold coins in the vault. The bridge project person owes the goldsmith 900 gold coins, and so that's an asset for the goldsmith. And the goldsmith owes depositors this 1,000 original gold coins plus the 900 gold coins that these workers who are now depositors feel like they have at the goldsmiths. So one thing I'm going to do right now is I'm going to start referring to this goldsmith as a central bank plus a commercial bank. So as we talked about before, the division of labor between the central bank and the commercial banks is that the central bank sets the interest rate that depositors get and that influences the rate that borrowers have to pay. This number over here and that number over there. And commercial banks are responsible for collecting deposits and giving out loans. So you might look at the fact that there's only 1,000 gold coins actually sitting in this vault, but 1,900 obligations that the banks have towards depositors, these people over here, and these workers over here who are now depositors, and you might think that the banks have just effectively created money out of thin air. Now the reason that's not true is because you have to take the bank's assets into account. So if you remember, the banks are owed 900 gold coins by this bridge project person over here. So if the bridge project pays back the banks in, let's say, gold coins, then after that, you will have 1,900 in this vault, because you will have the original 1,000 plus the 900 plus some interest, which we're going to ignore for now, that they will pay back to the banks. And so you'll have 1,900 gold coins in the banks and 1,900 in obligations, and these things will match. And this is conditional upon the bank actually realizing these assets for their true value, meaning it's dependent upon the bridge project actually paying back the banks. Now, admittedly, if the bridge project doesn't pay back the banks, the banks are in trouble. So imagine that this 900 assets is actually becomes equal to zero. And the reason it becomes equal to zero is because this person built the bridge thinking that he would be able to sell it in a year or two for a profit of, say, you know, 1,100 gold coins or something. And it turns out that he's unable to sell it and no one's using the bridge and the money that the central bank gave him has already been spent and so there's just basically no way that he can pay back the banks. So in this case, the amount in obligations that the banks have to other people is still 1,900, but they're only ever going to have 1,000 gold coins in the vault because this 900 no longer exists. And because of this, their liabilities would be greater than actually what they have in the vault. And so this situation would be called a situation where the bank is insolvent. Another thing that can go wrong in this entire system is that these depositors, independent of whether or not this bridge project person can pay you back, these depositors might one day wake up and decide that they really want to redeem all the notes that the banks have given them for actual gold. So imagine that one day these depositors over here wake up and decide to go to the commercial banks and try to get their 1,000 gold coins out. And also imagine at the same time these depositors, the ones who believe that they have 900 sitting in these vaults, go to the commercial banks and try to redeem their 900. So that would mean that to actually meet all their redemptions, the commercial banks would have to have 1,900 gold coins in the vault, which they don't have. They only have 1,000. And so if that happens, that's typically called a liquidity crisis. Now, in reality, insolvency and a liquidity crisis tend not to be independent events. 
And what I mean by that is that at the slightest whiff that these commercial banks might be insolvent, it's typical for depositors to go to the bank and try to redeem their money for gold. And so it's not unusual for the slightest sign of insolvency to lead to a liquidity crisis. So at this point, you might be thinking, wait a second, I thought that during the gold standard, every dollar out in circulation was backed by the equivalent amount in gold. And my response to that would be, you're both right and not. You're right in the sense that if the central banks or the commercial banks told you that if you came to them with one dollar, they would give you one gold coin, you could actually go to the commercial banks, give them one dollar, and get back one gold coin in return. But the reality of the situation is that there wasn't enough gold in the central bank's vaults to actually do that transaction for every dollar that was in circulation in the economy. So if everyone who had a dollar in the economy went to the central bank and tried to redeem that dollar for the gold coins, there's no way the central bank or the commercial banks would be able to pay them one gold coin in return. And that's because they didn't have that many gold coins. Let me give you a real life example. In 1913 in Britain, right before they went off the gold standard, there were five billion worth of currency, five billion US dollars worth of currency circulating in the economy. But there was only 800 million US dollars worth of gold in the central bank vaults. And so even though the British Central Bank was willing to exchange one British pound for one British pound worth of gold, they didn't have enough gold to do that for everyone who was carrying British pounds. And so in this example over here, the ratio of currency out there to the amount of gold they actually had was 5 billion divided by 800 million. So that number divided by that number. And that gives you a ratio of 6.25 to 1. Meaning the amount of currency circulating in the economy was 6.25 times the amount of gold there was sitting in the vault. So you might be thinking, what is the point of having a gold standard if my currency isn't one to one backed by gold? And my response to that would be that if you felt that this ratio was getting too high, so for example, in our example with the um, central bank, the commercial banks, and the bridge project, the ratio of money supply, as in money circulating, to the amount of gold was 1,900 divided by 1,000, which equals 1 1.9 to 1. If you felt that this ratio was getting way too high, let's say that it was getting to 20 to 1, you could then go to the commercial bank, take your US dollars or whatever currency you're dealing with, and exchange that currency for gold. And because there isn't enough gold in these vaults to meet all those obligations, it wouldn't take many people going to the central bank or the commercial bank and trying to redeem their money for gold to deplete all the gold in this vault. And that gives governments and central banks a very strong incentive to keep this ratio, to keep it low. Low enough that people see value in the currency, because if it gets too high, people will go to the banks and try to redeem their currency for gold.